State election, lots of spending. We're gonna discuss a lot. Matilda asks, Manita and Adeshla, they know what's up. It's state night. State night. State night. The Victorian election is this weekend, so welcome to the season finale of State Night, the show where I force Guardian Australia's world-class state political reporters to come and explain everything to me as if I have no idea what's going on. It's a fun little bit we do and definitely not shockingly close to the truth. Anyway, uh, for this final time, I'd like to welcome the amazing Adeshla Ore and the inimitable Benita Colt. Where's... Where's Benita Adeshla? Um, Where's Benita Adeshla? I don't know how to tell you this. Just say it. She's with Daniel Andrews. Heartbreak aside, um, we're drawing towards the end of the election, right? A few days to go, we're in the final push, democracy is in the air. Um, but election night can be very confusing, especially when you only have one person to explain it to you, but um, why don't you run me through what are some of the key seats that we should be looking at? Yeah, so if you take a really kind of zoomed out approach, you've got three main battles that I think are going to be really interesting on election night. So you've got the Labor and the Greens battle, you've got the Liberal and, and the Independents. Both of those are in um, some of the inner city Melbourne seats. And then you've got finally Labor's heartland seats in the outer western suburbs that they'll be, you know, defending off challenges from both Liberal and Independent candidates. <laughs> That's really interesting. I mean, I know a lot, obviously, about having to defend your heartlands from challenges, but um, why don't we just get to the main course? I figured, um, what's better on election night than a map? And what's better than a map, but a wearable map? Oh, wow. Yes. So here we have a beautiful hand-painted electoral map of metropolitan Melbourne. That one's for you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, it's good. And here we have a beautiful hand painted, spent hours on it, um, map uh, of the regional Victorian electorates that was meant to be for Benita, but I guess I'll pop it on. Given we are drinking soy milk today, ignore the cow, uh, why don't we start with the greens? Uh, what seats are they trying to win? The Greens are really excited from their result at the May federal elections. That was their best ever result. And they're really hopeful that they'll be able to replicate some of that success um, this weekend. Uh, so I'm noticing, one second, let me get out my spoon. Uh, they do hold three seats currently, Melbourne, Brunswick and Paran down there. Which ones are they hoping to grab? Yeah, so they're eyeing off other kind of, you know, inner city Melbourne seats that are held by Labor. Mm -hmm. So Richmond is probably the most likely. That one there? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then Northcote as well. That one up there. Mm -hmm. And Albert Park as well. Oh, the little one with the little piers and the ports down there. All right. Yeah. Do they have a hope in hell of any of them? Where, where could we actually be seeing more green? Yeah, so Richmond's probably the most likely. That's a seat that the current Labor MP is retiring in, so it kind of means Labor loses that incumbency factor. Um, but I think the trend that you're seeing in all of these seats is there have been a lot of apartments that have been built, which has led to kind of an influx of younger people um, and a higher proportion of rental voters. You say renters, um, I'm hearing hipsters, but what would happen, I mean, if they did win all three of those seats, if we have six suddenly green seats on the map, what does that mean for Labor? Is that bad news? Yeah, it could be. The Greens are hopeful that they might be able to hold the balance of power mm. after the next election. And what's the balance of power? So that's in the event of a minority government. Mm, and um, what's a minority government? Yeah, so when a party can't um, win the majority of seats um, in the lower house, they may need to team up with another party to be able to govern. Oh, so to get more than 50%, they have to make some little deals, like similar to what we saw with the Gillard government and I mean, even in our own federal election this time round, there was a few days where we we're like, ooh, might be a hung parliament. So you're saying that could potentially happen in Victoria? Yeah, look, it's looking more likely according to recent polling and the Greens have even put out their priorities in the event of a hung parliament. So it's things like raising the age of criminal responsibility to 14 and putting a cap on rent increases as well. Um, but the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews, he's been really consistent in saying that he wouldn't be entering into any agreements with the Greens. Feels like not necessarily something he'll have a choice over if it comes down to it, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, so there's more than one colourful wave we've been talking about. The federal election we saw, the teal wave, which was obviously independents who were quite climate focused and went after and were quite successful in winning over very traditional liberal seats. And we spoke a bit about this in episode one, but maybe could you just run me through what are those little battlegrounds? Where should we be looking if we want to see that drama unfold? 
Yeah, I think the seat of Hawthorne, firstly, is going to be really interesting. Oh, uh, this Hawthorne right there. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's uh, red. Tell me about that. Yeah, so it's a seat that unexpectedly fell to Labor the 2018 during the downslide. Mm. Um, and I think it's a seat that the party isn't really confident it will be able to retain. So it's more of a battle between um, the Liberal candidate and the Independent candidate. And then in the neighbouring seat of Q. Q right there. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's the seat that's probably most likely um, to be able to be nabbed by a teal. Um, and then you've got Caulfield as well. Oh, Caulfield right down there below Paran. Uh, tell me about Caulfield. This is an interesting one, right? It is, yeah. It's an ultra marginal seat and it's really kind of a three-way contest between a teal independent, um, a Labor candidate and the incumbent Liberal um, member. And that's a David Southwick. So he's the deputy um, leader of the Liberal, of the Victorian Liberal Party. Is that the only fights they're fighting? Where else are the Liberals really going hard on? Yeah, you've got Brighton and Sandringham. These are seats that have independents running, but they're not teal independents. They're not being backed by Climate 200, which backed a lot of the um, federal teals. Um, these are seats that Labor almost snatched at the 2018 election. So in Brighton, the current member, James Newbury, he actually almost lost his seat to Labor's candidate last election, who was a 19-year-old university student. Yeah, so potentially a kid just looking for something to do on a Saturday, nearly a took out one of the safest Liberal seats ever. That's not great news, right? Though they're not fighting a 19 year old this time, but the, the fact that those two seats are still even a little bit up in the air, what does that mean for the Liberal Party? Yeah, look, I think the Liberal Party, and particularly the Victorian branch, is still really reeling from the devastating kind of losses that they saw at the federal election. Um, there's going to be more soul searching, no doubt, after the state election. But there's a real question of, you know, who does the Liberal Party represent now? And I think even within the party, there's people in different camps. You know, those who say stay and fight and others that say maybe we need to kind of accept that some of these formerly blue ribbon seats are not Liberal Party seats anymore. Hmm. And... Look, I can't help but notice there's a massive section of red on your show, which actually made painting the west of Melbourne very easy. Uh, there was a lot more detail to have to do on this one. This one, big paint brushes. Um, but it's not all fine and dandy within that red sea, right? That's the Labour heartland. Tell me about that. Yeah, so Melbourne's outer west has traditionally been Labour heartland. It's, you know, working class, very unionised area. So it's kind of like the bread and butter for Labour. There's more people in service jobs, which meant when the pandemic hit, these people didn't, couldn't necessarily just work from home. So that means you saw much higher rates of COVID in these areas. So I think there could be a backlash of the Andrews government's handling of the pandemic that we might see in these areas. Oh, so we joke about no one wants to talk about COVID anymore. But, I mean, if, if there was anyone where COVID would decide their vote, it would potentially be in that Labor heartland, that west of Melbourne area. Yeah, and we've seen evidence of this at the federal election in May where there was a protest vote, so a vote that went towards, you know, minor parties like Clive Palmer's United Australia Party, particularly in the outer um, suburban areas of Victoria. But does that mean that the seats will necessarily go to the Liberals instead? No, not necessarily. I mean, at the federal election, you saw Labor's primary vote drop in some of these outer suburban seats. So when you mark one next to the vote, the person you vote for first, that dropped for Labor? Yeah, that's right. But I think you still saw people um, preferencing Labor above the Liberals in these areas, which meant that once you're dealing with the preferences, they were still coming back to the Labor Party. And I think there's pretty low kind of brand recognition for the Liberals. Um, in these outer western areas, but they're definitely throwing a lot of kind of, you know, announcements and funding and really trying to, hoping that they'll be able to pick up seats here. So, you know, maybe even if we don't see it this election, like within the decades to come, we're going to be starting to see more battles over here. I, I pointed um, really just towards Gippsland there, but I did mean the west of Melbourne on your show. Yeah, for sure. It could be a more kind of long-term strategy for the Liberal Party. Mm. Speaking of um, Gippsland, though, uh, the Nationals, we haven't mentioned them yet. Uh, they are the other party in the Victorian coalition. We see some uh, nice dark green here. What are they up to? The Nationals will be trying to win back seats like Shepherd and Mildura. Oh, oh, I don't even need the spoon. Uh, Shepparton right here and Mildura, this big one over here. Yeah, and so yeah. they're both seats that are held currently by rural independents. All right, who's gonna win it, Ashla? Cut to the chase. Look, I think it's more of a question of will Labor be able to govern in their own right or will it be a Labor minority government? Mm -hmm. um, if we look at all the polling, it definitely suggests that Labor will win more seats than the coalition. Um, How many seats would the coalition need to take government? The opposition would need to win an extra 18 seats. Okay, so probably not. 
it's, it would be a mammoth task. And you've got to remember as well that they're also kind of fighting off a lot of battles and trying to retain the seats that they already hold too. And so ultimately with the Liberal Party, there'll be a lot of members internally in other parts of Australia that I think will be watching the Victorian election really closely and trying to see, you know, what is the future of some of these blue ribbon seats and how do we go on from here? Yeah, I mean, I guess this is the first election since the federal election. It's the first time the Teals have been tested really. This will tell us if it was a blip or if it signals a bigger shift in Australian politics and perhaps a departure away from the two-party system. Hmm, so maybe uh, some bigger structural questions to be answered on Saturday night. And to be honest with you, I feel like I'm pretty well informed, uh, which apologies uh, means that I don't think I really uh, need this, these state nights anymore. In fact, I think um, I'm probably better off on my own, mostly because there's uh, probably something coming up in New South Wales in March and I want to be a bit of a free bird when that happens. So look, it's been so nice to know you. Um, all right, and uh, just tell Benita.